41st Annual House District 8 Spaghetti Dinner. State Senator Michael Johnson. Thanks, Kip, and uh, good evening, everybody. Pardon my, my lost voice. Um, I lost it arguing over nutrition equity on the floor of the Senate on Friday, uh, so that was why I'm without it. But I just want to give a couple quick updates. Um, yeah, the first is that we did, uh, I, I can tell you as a background for the story, after the bill yesterday, I went back to the high school that I was the principal of for the last five years, because we, we have a ritual that we do at our high school where every time a student gets accepted to college, we do a significant celebration for them, and they, uh, we, we have them sign a banner that says they've been admitted, and every student climbs this ladder to sign the banner, and as part of that, they ask three or four people to come who've been influential in their life and hold the ladder while they climb. As we, all, we always say, we know every kid in this room got dealt a rickety ladder, and were it not for the folks that held your ladder, you might not have made that climb. And so I was honored that two of my former kids asked me to come yesterday and hold their ladders, and so I was there and went up, and uh, both amazing kids, uh, both graduated in the top of their class, both admitted to college. Uh, one of them is documented, and one of them is not. One of them will start college in the fall, and one of them will not. And that is a system that our state government continues to propagate, and we wonder why we have a soaring Latino dropout rate. We're wondering why we have 18 and 19 and 20 year old kids without jobs or without college education or without real opportunity. And so uh, we are going to fight like hell on this one. Um, and we got to have a fight. I, I will say that Kip mentioned that Beth and I share uh, a major badge of honor, which was in both chambers. We are both the, the representative and the senator that got elected with the single largest percentage of the vote in all of the state of Colorado. We're both about 84 percent, which is thanks to Alex. Um, so I, I would just say that uh, when Kip talks about how important the turnout is in this, in this district, there is nothing that makes you feel more empowered than to know how deep the army is that stands behind you. Uh, and so when things get heated on days like this, to know that we have such a powerful force of folks that are behind us makes a tremendous difference. I also just want to say one quick thing about the budget, and then I'll close, uh, which is, uh, Beth's right, and as a former high school principal, I do the math this way. You can look a lot at how many million is cut and what percentage, and the statistics all are very confusing. But here's how the actual numbers work out if you're a teacher or you're a principal, which is with this current round of cuts, Colorado now spends $2,000 less per child than the average state in America. $2,000 less per child than the average state. So let me tell you what that means as a principal. That means as a principal right now, I'm walking into a ninth grade English class, and in a class with 25 kids, I have to cut $50,000 out of that one classroom. Imagine that task. Imagine walking into a classroom and trying to find $50,000 and pull out of it. You can take out the smart boards, you can take out the computers, you can take out the desks and the chairs and the walls, that probably gets you about 9,000. Which means the only way you get that number is if you take the people out. If you take teachers out, you take paraprofessionals out, you take the people that actually do all of the work. So I signed on early uh, with Raleigh Heath, the partner, on this ballot amendment in 2011 to raise revenue for the state of Colorado, because what I know is that we have more cuts coming at this scale. As the RS stimulus funds drop off, these numbers are getting worse. So uh, I'm honored that actually we're going to be hosting probably the Denver operation for that ballot initiative will be run out of our office in Park Hill. And so and I'll tell you right now, it's going to be an uphill battle because a lot of our institutional partners, the people that funded referendum C and referendum D, are not going to fund this operation because they don't think we can win. And I understand that. They're, they're good friends. They're good colleagues. But we're not going to have three, six, eight million dollars to run this campaign. We're going to have people that deeply care about not seeing services continue to be cut as the economy continues to get worse. And so if there ever was going to be a grassroots revolution, it's going to be this campaign this year uh, to try and do that. So I would love to have your help when the time comes so we can avoid continuing to balance the budget on the backs of kids and old people and sick people. So I'm, I'm going to close with this, uh, which is I think tonight is a very emotional night. And as I drove over here tonight, there was a there's a favorite quote of mine that I think about a lot as to why I, I do I do policy work, and it is from an Israeli poet. His name is Yehuda Amakai, and the quote says, "To live is to build a ship and a harbor at the same time." 
and to finish the harbor long after the ship has gone down. We lost two of our best ships this year. But the amazing thing about those two folks that we lost is they were deeply committed to building harbors. They were committed every day in their life to making this place a harbor that all of the boats, when the weather got cold and the storm got hard, could find a place to come seek solace. And so while we mourn the passing of those two ships tonight, I couldn't feel more proud to stand in the harbor that they helped build. So thank you.